There are two prongs of this effort. The first prong, of course, is winning these races in 2010. Then, in 2011, you have to be ready to redraw the maps. And what the Republicans were able to do in states like Ohio and Pennsylvania and North Carolina and Michigan and Florida and Wisconsin was move the redistricting process deep behind closed doors and use redistricting as a blunt force partisan weapon in a way that it had not been all the way back to the first gerrymander in 1790. So in Wisconsin, the operatives working on redistricting barricaded themselves into a law firm across the street from the Capitol and tried to claim attorney-client privilege for all of the negotiations and map-making that were going on. And they even made Republican members of the legislature there sign a non-disclosure agreement if they wanted access to the room. In North Carolina, they bring in a master mapmaker named Tom Hofeller, who is probably better at jiggering and rejiggering district lines than anybody. And they draw maps in North Carolina that give Republicans a 10-3 advantage on the congressional side. And Hofeller has a presentation that he gives when he goes to talk to state legislators. And it is all about secrecy and privacy. You do not fire the staff until you are completely sure that redistricting is done. You do not walk away from your computer and leave anything showing on it ever. You remember exactly what kind of legal hell one false email can put you in. It is as if he is training master spies and espionage and not, you know, drawing the lines that make up the fundamental building blocks of our democracy. Right. And of course, we want to remind people, the reason people are drawing congressional boundaries in in hotel rooms and in secret is because typically the lines are done by acts of state legislatures and a lot of state legislation is drafted privately before it's voted on. So in the end, You know, lawmakers do cast a vote. The votes are recorded. It's signed by the governor. It's a bill that conforms to rules of legislative procedure. But the real stuff gets done privately. Exactly. Now, you know, gerrymandering isn't new. And I don't think politicians before 2010 were, like, totally benign in their use of... of, They certainly uh, were not. ...of this subject. So why was it so much more effective or aggressive in 2010? Is part of it technology? I think technology is almost all of it. Citizens United and the money that comes into the system is a piece of it. The really ingenious plan that Jankowski devises is part of it. But it's the technology that makes these lines so precise and impregnable right now. There's a program called Maptitude that is used by lawmakers and operatives in just about every state who are working on redistricting. And I had someone who was involved in the redistricting in Arizona, a show me how it works. And there is more information available through Maptitude that when you look at a congressional map and you say, boy, the shape of that is very strange, there is a reason behind each and every one of those curves. Every little jut and turn that on a map you say, I don't know why that could possibly be there, a map maker knows why it's there. With Maptitude, it is fully loaded with just about every census information, with economic information, with every precinct by precinct results of elections all the way down ballot going back for years. And you can draw these lines with complete knowledge of how they will respond now. And the difference, frankly, between 2000 and 2010, I mean, think of the way we texted in 2000. We didn't have a keyboard on our phones. We used a number pad, essentially, to, you know, find a letter. Redistricting in 1990, in 2000, it was still, it was still horse and buggy. It becomes a rocket ship in 2010, thanks to computing power. 
when this is done, when you look at some of these districts on a map, what do the shapes look like? They are incredibly strange. There's a district in, in Michigan that I went out and drove every turn of between Detroit and Pontiac. It's Michigan's 14th, and it goes about 135 miles, and it takes you all day to you know go turn by turn. What you see first is that this is a district designed to connect the poorest neighborhoods in Detroit with the poorest neighborhoods in Pontiac so that you can put as many African-American voters into one district, make it a district that elects a Democrat with about 75 or 80 percent of the vote, and then all of the neighboring uh, suburban uh, districts, as a result, are more Republican. And as you take these turns, time and again over the course of the day, I would look at the map and say, boy, there's an interesting turn right here, there's an interesting notch here, and every single time there was a reason. And the reason was to pack all the Democrats in that district so they wouldn't weaken Republicans in surrounding districts. Yes. Now, Democrats aren't stupid, and they've been involved in redistricting for a long, long time. Where were the Democrats when all the, this was happening, when the Republicans were targeting these state legislative seats? Did they, were they just... They fell asleep at the wheel. Hmm. This was a catastrophic strategic failure by the Democratic Party. Uh, Chris Jankowski tells me that throughout the fall of, of 2010, he's out in the field and he can't believe that the Democrats aren't out there spending any money. The Democrats never saw this coming, and it's political malpractice because the Republican Party announced their plans in big, bright, flashing neon lights. In an op-ed piece in March 2010 in the Wall Street Journal, Karl Rove says, we are going to use redistricting this year to take back the Congress. It was announced. It was not hidden. I don't know if the Democratic leadership simply doesn't read the Wall Street Journal, but it was right there. Steve Israel, who led the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee after the debacle of 2010 for the Democratic Party, tells me that the Democratic National Committee simply whistled past the graveyard. And in states where Democrats did control the state house, Maryland, Illinois, when redistricting occurred, did they do the same things? Did they gerrymander the line so as to benefit their party? There are two examples of where Democrats did effectively gerrymander after 2010, and it is in Maryland and it's in Illinois. And what the Republicans were able to do, which is a little bit different is they were able to take states that were blue or purple and make them bright red. And that, to me, seems to be the difference. You can look at Maryland and say that there's probably one or maybe two more seats that the Democrats control that they wouldn't have had if you apportioned seats based on the popular vote. But it's certainly not as egregious as a state like Pennsylvania, where you have a majority of voters ending up with, you know, fewer than 30 percent of the seats. Uh, you go around the country and look at what's happening on this issue, and it seems you find some encouraging developments, people taking another look at redistricting methods. What do you say? I think that members of both parties want our votes to count, and we want the system to work, and we're aware that things aren't quite working. And when you look at the kind of referendums that have passed on redistricting in red states and in blue states, in Florida, in Arizona, in California, in Ohio, it's a sign that people understand that our democracy isn't working. Um, when you put a referendum about nonpartisan redistricting on the ballot, it wins. People fundamentally understand questions of fairness. And in those states where they have passed, how have things changed? Well, commissions sometimes work and sometimes don't work. Um, that is to say, taking redistricting out of the legislature and putting it in the hands of an appointed commission? Is that what that means? That's exactly right. Um, you can look at Arizona, which is a case that went to the Supreme Court and that a commission was upheld, its constitutionality, but its basic functioning 
there's a lot of questions about whether that the partisanship simply seeped back in a secret hidden way and whether the politicians simply found another way to game that system once it was taken out of the legislators' hands, it stayed in the hands of the operatives. In Florida, certainly, what you saw was an effort by Republican strategists in the state to conduct a shadow redistricting process in violation of the Fair Districts referendum. But the beauty of that was that because the referendum had been passed, good government groups in Florida were able to uh, file a lawsuit, and in the discovery process, unearthed a trove of emails showing exactly what had happened, and a number of those districts have had to be redrawn.